Follow Me, the series, Follow Me Undefiled. It's been a wonderful study through the book of Matthew. <clears throat> the first time I looked at the book of Matthew from this angle, uh, I remember often people teaching me um, as I was coming up in Baptist churches that Matthew is geared towards the Jews. But the more I study it, it seems like Matthew is actually geared towards the disciples and so that they would learn and grow. And as he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And so I believe this is actually the mandate you find in, in Matthew is to follow Christ and let him bring you on to good works. Fishing men, as it were. Matthew chapter 14. We ended off in verse 33. We'll go to verse 34 then, where the Bible says, Matthew 14, verse 34, And when they were gone over, they came into the land of Gennesaret. And when the man of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all that country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched were made perfectly whole. I love that little passage. I think it ties just as much into chapter 15 as it does the chapter previous, kind of springboards it, because what you see in verse 1 of chapter 15, then came. So it's this kind of transition that takes place, and we start off in the next passage. But there in verse 34... It talks about how the knowledge of him and that the men had led them to bring everybody that they could find that needed Christ, that needed him. They thought to themselves, if only they could touch the hem of his garment. Verse 36, they besought him, Jesus, that they might only touch the hem of his garment. So these men knew Christ enough to bring him and say, he has the power to heal. He is able. All they have to do is do and receive what he has available. The Bible then says, though, that those of these men that had knowledge of Christ brought all these that were sick and these that were diseased, and they knew that by faith, if they only touched, they could be healed. It still took, in the end of verse 36, as many as touched were made perfectly whole. They had to do the touching, didn't they? You can bring somebody to Christ, that person still needs to reach out and touch Christ in order that they would be healed. We see here then the power of just the touch from God. A touch of God comes into a life and they can be made completely whole of their ailment. I love seeing the faith of those that brought him. It reminds me of the story when they, when they brought the man that was sick. Four of them bore him on a stretcher. and For the press they couldn't get in, but they broke up the roof and laid him down. And then Jesus saw the faith of the four and therefore healed the one. And that's what you see here, I believe, as well. Those that had faith to bring them to Christ and encourage them to just reach out and touch. Continue on then in verse 1 of chapter 15. The Bible says, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. So while there's all these multitude coming to touch Jesus, these of the scribes and Pharisees come not to touch, but to question and challenge Jesus. It's like the multitude gathered around Christ and they saw an opportunity to come and confound the multitude and push them away from the Savior at this time. They came with their question. The tradition of our sect leaders. These great men of our group is being broken and ignored, Jesus. Why do your men, why do your disciples do that which is not lawful. Referring to then their tradition. Why are you breaking the tradition of all of our sect leaders, these great men? Why are your disciples eating ugh, with unwashed hands? Now there was a previous case of this that took place. You can keep your finger there in Matthew chapter 15 and go to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. In the previous example, in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus deals with this exact time when the disciples were challenged again for their eating habits. As if that was the, the, the most pertinent thing that you ought to deal with. 
In the eyes of these Pharisees, it certainly was. They brought it up a second time here. Here's another example. Again, it happened in Matthew chapter 12. Another example is in Luke chapter 6, where it reads in verse 1, And it came to pass on the second Sabbath, after the first, that he went through the cornfields. And his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat. And this phrase, rubbing them in their hands, is not excluded in Matthew, is why I wanted to bring us to here. Because again, they are plucking and eating, and it's called to attention that they're not washing their hands. They're not washing their food. They're, they're eating uncleanly, or at least not according to our tradition. Continues on, and we find, though, that they're not going to focus on the washing the, of the hands, but Luke here draws that to our attention. That's good. In verse 2, it says, And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day? So here's the crux of the matter unto them. Why are you breaking the Sabbath by walking about and harvesting? Well, certainly they were out for a walk. Maybe the challenge was that they were harvesting and bringing in food, but they were just taking enough so that they could rub it in their hands and eat. Uh, maybe the challenge was their distance in which they were walking because the scribes and the Pharisees had all sorts of laws above and beyond what the Bible says. The Bible says rest on the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. It doesn't say you can only walk 100 steps. You can't use an elevator unless you have some unbelieving goyim push the button for you. You can't have your lights on. You can't do uh, this and that. and all. You can't strike a fire. You can't get, they have all of these rules even today in Israel that are above and beyond the command of God. And yet here they're saying it's lawful. It's not lawful. Paul said all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. And Paul was a man after God's own heart, following him and his statutes. But Jesus answers them smartly and wisely, as he often does. Verse 3, And Jesus answering them said, Have ye not read, I love that question, so much as this, what David did when himself was in hunger, and they which were with him. Their biggest problem, these Pharisees and scribes, was they're not reading their Bibles. They're not in their scriptures. But the scribes are spending all of their time laboring and copying and penning out the, the words of God and, and keeping record of, of the histories of, of, the, of the works of God and all of these things they're taking part of. But Jesus says, you're obviously not reading it. The Pharisees were teachers of the law. They were, they were constantly in the synagogues preaching from the Bible and trying to teach and expound to the people what is contained in the scriptures. And Jesus says, you're not reading the Bible. Have you not read what David did? Verse 4, how he went into the house of God and did take and eat the showbread and gave also to them that were with him, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests alone. So Jesus brings up, here's something that actually is not lawful for David to do. Nevertheless, he did it. Why did he do that? How did he get away with it? What gives him the right? Verse 5 says, and he said unto them that the son of man is Lord also of the Sabbath. What is he saying? There's a higher authority even to their laws and statutes and to their to their their the, the government of the Old Testament scriptures, and that is the Son of Man. Jesus is the Word. He is the very words of God. He is above that very authority. He is that authority. And therefore, if Jesus says it's all right to eat the showbread in this case, it is lawful, talking to David. Then it's so. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Verse 6, And it came to pass on another Sabbath that he entered in the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose hand was withered. And I'll leave that alone. So what saith the scriptures is what's important. Go back to Matthew chapter 15. And what saith the Lord is of the highest authority. And these Pharisees were obviously not reading it because they had come up with their own traditions that they felt trumped the commands of God. Verse 15 or verse 3 of chapter 15 says, "But he answered and said unto them, why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition?" Jesus is very clearly indicating, look, the command of God is greater than your tradition. And what is the command that he's about to talk about? Look at verse 4 through 6. He's going to bring up an example for God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. 
and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. The command was to honor your father and mother and to not curse them. Their tradition was one of gifts by convenience. In other words, when he says, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mayest be profited me, it's an opportune time to bring a gift unto your parents this one time and say, whatever you can be profited by me is yours as well. Again, essentially putting it in the hands of the father and mother to ask of them. And then they said, I'm free. Well, to me, that is exactly what God says, making the command of none effect. God says, honor your parents. In other words, it's to be active activity done by the children to honor and reverence and care for the parents, not that it would be turned around and the parents would go to their children and ask for honor and ask for care be provided for them. Honoring your father and mother isn't just revering them, it's actually caring for them when they get to the point where they need care. Not cursing father or mother is blessing them and, and, and cherishing them and giving them proper and due reverence. But both of these commands, they negated. They chopped off by their tradition, which basically says, I brought mom a gift at Christmas time, and I said, hey, mom, if you need anything, let me know. But whatsoever you may be profited of me, just let me know. And in doing so, mom's not going to go to son and say, son, I need you to help me pay the electricity. Son, I need you to clean up some things in my house. Son, I need you to take out... The no, 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 mom's not... She's going to keep that stuff to herself... And then she has this one-time gift. And you know what the Pharisees thought of that? They said, I'm free. I've honored, I've cared, for, I've done what I needed to do for my mom. I said, if you need anything, let me know. And therefore, they cross out the command and lift up their tradition of gifts of convenience, negating, honoring, and not cursing their parents. And this is just one of the many examples. You've transgressed the commandment so that you can keep your tradition have you not read christ is going to bring up again is what he's bringing up again In verse 7 it says ye hypocrites well did Isaiah prophesy of you saying this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips but their heart is far from me but in vain they do worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men teaching for doctrines the traditions above the commandment of men and essentially negating them all together. Now, this phrase comes from Isaiah chapter 29. And a good, good rule of thumb here is, especially with Isaiah, because he seems to be the prophet that really cuts these Pharisees to the core. Isaiah 29 is where you'll find it. And, you know, I, uh, if you have a, a reference Bible, you can find it. Um, one that doesn't have any... Um, too much extra commentary and it is probably best but i also just do keyword searches or if you got a good bible dictionary it'll tell you where you can go and find these verses but i found it then that phrase that he's talking about um you do honor me with your lips but your heart is far from me it comes from isaiah 29 a good thing to do whenever jesus says thus hath the prophet spoken go and see what the prophet has spoken in context isaiah 29 then let's look in verse 9 Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of sleep, deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. Here, God is talking through the prophet Isaiah to a people that are drunken, a people that are slumbering. But God says, but you're not drunk with wine. You are drunk with a spirit of deep sleep. He says that your eyes are closed to the extent that not only the people, but the prophets and seers hath their eyes blinded to what God is saying. Wonder and cry out, you're drunken. Why? Because God hath given you that drunken spirit. He hath given you that spirit of deep sleep. And next time you hear a Pentecostal get up and say, I'm drunk in the spirit. Yeah, they probably are right. And it's not a good thing. It's a curse from God. To be uh, unclear in vision. To be stumbling and staggering with respect to the word of God. To be blinded to these truths. 
That's the group that God is referring to here when Isaiah is speaking against. You blind seers. It's amazing because that's exactly who Jesus is talking about back in Matthew chapter 15. This continues on in verse 11. It says, And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed. Okay, so the vision from the prophets and from the seers and from your rulers is become as the words of a book that is sealed. What good is that? Which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. So the vision, in other words, the foresight of God, the knowledge of God, the, the truths of God are a sealed book unto these drunken seers, these drunken prophets, these drunken rulers that are in a deep sleep. And so the vision, the word of God is brought to them and it's sealed unto them. You're learned, read this and tell us what it says. And they said, I can't for it is sealed. And then verse 12, it says, and the book is delivered to him that is not learned saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I'm not learned. And it's the unlearned that is relying on the learned to know what the sealed book says. And you see then that the blind are leading the blind. And what does the New Testament tell us? Both are going to fall into a ditch. The learned can't open the book. The unlearned can't understand the book. Wherefore, look at verse 13. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their lips, with their mouth, and with their lips they do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. We learned last week a little bit about the fear of the Lord from the book of Proverbs, and the wonderful blessing that comes as a result of the fear of God. But here, the fear of the Lord comes to the unlearned, and it's diluted, it's corrupted, it's changed. It's not what the word of God says. It's the precepts of men. And that's, that's shown by the fact that when they come to honor, when they come to draw near, their heart is far, far, far removed. They're, they're, not, they're not getting it. And that's what God here is saying. The learned can't open the book. The unlearned are looking to those blind guides and they're getting nothing from it. And therefore, the fear of God or the reverence to God or the commands of God or the, the ways of God are nothing but the ever-changing, manipulative, self-serving precepts of men. And that's ultimately what the precepts of men evolve into. We don't get better in time. We tend to corrupt. And when men don't have the word of God as their authority and as their standard, why? Because it's bound up then they're just going to start teaching their own precepts and they will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And in their hearts that are ever-changing, in their hearts that are manipulative and bent towards pleasing self, in their hearts they will always teach the precepts of men and therefore take whatever they have as tradition, because that's what it becomes, and they will put it above the commands of God. They don't even know the commands of God anymore by the time this prophecy goes forward. And that's kind of what you see when you look into the Catholic Church because they shut up the book a long time ago and they just started teaching their own thoughts, their own precepts, their own ideas, their own visions, their own ideas, and then eventually you have what is there today. It's a closed book cult that revolves completely around the traditions and precepts of men. And the only fear of God that dwells in that place comes because of what the men have said. It's a crying shame. I, my wife will tell you that it did help her to at least have some sort of reverence for God, but it was unreasonable and completely irrational. She feared when she stood in that monument of a building with gold furnishings and stained glass everywhere. She feared that the gold-plated statue representing Jesus was actual Jesus, and that's what she needed to fear. Why? Because of the precepts of men that had taught her such a crazy thing. That's Jesus on the cross. A young mind doesn't understand that it's an image of it or whatever. And therefore, her fear was only as a result of the precepts of men. I'm sure if anybody's grown up in Catholic Church or in any type of idolatrous religion, they'll have similar testimonies of these things. The Word of God is put away, shut up even, then those that are learned teach their own opinions, and those that are unlearned follow after because they have nothing else to rely on 
Verse 14 then continues in that same chapter. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder for my wisdom, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. And so here, the judgment of God comes out blinding these people, but God is going to use it for himself to get glory. He's going to do a great work among the people, even make the wisdom of the wise who have a shut up book to perish. And the understanding of the prudent men that ought to be teaching good and right and true things is hidden and removed. But look at this, verse 15. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord. And their works are in the dark. And they say, who seeth us and who knoweth us? And that's often the case with these false prophets, with these, with these that are led about of their own wills, these deceitful counselors. They work in darkness and they hide the truth of what their religion is always about. And that's what we see, with whether it's the priests or the imams or whatever, or the, or the, the Mormon elders, whoever it is, when they build a religion around themselves that is 100% percent based on their own precepts and their thoughts of a closed book the next thing you know they just become these deceitful counselors working in darkness but god is still in control look at verse 16 surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay so try as they may to lead about their religions in the name of christ or in the name of god god here is indicating that he still has them esteemed as the potter's clay. You know what that means? You're moldable. You're pliable. You may think you're in control. You may think you're in charge, O oh Pharisee. You may think you're leading, O oh, oh, Imam. You may think you're doing right, O oh, oh, um, oh, priest and pope. But ultimately, you're as potter's clay in the hand of God. And God here is going to do a work. It says, for shall the work of, say, of him that made it, he made it not. Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? It is, is it not a very little while, and Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest? Lebanon, the land north of Tyre, that land north of Samaria, that land that according to the Jews was unwanted, wretched, full of Gentiles, and, and, and to Jewish society, an anathema. They want nothing to do with that. God here is saying, Lebanon is going to be a fruitful field. Why? Because I'm going to take your rebellion, mold it in my hand, and cause that those would turn away from your wisdom, your understanding, your prudence will be all hid away, and they will become a fruitful field. God, again, here is promising, as he reproves the Jews, that the Gentiles will be grafted in. Continue on in verse 18, and it says, And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book. How do the deaf hear? Well, here's the promise here. They'll hear the word of the book. The eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The meek also shall inherit their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. And isn't this just exactly what we saw when the men brought them to Jesus, and they thought, if I could just touch him. What an irrational thought. If I could just touch the Lord to the Pharisees, it must have been like, huh, huh, no, you have to keep the Sabbath. You have to do the works. You have to follow this law and this statute and this judgment, right? They make all these precepts more important than the command of God. And the command of God ultimately is just faith in him. And so the meek comes, the blind come, the deaf hear. And as a result of, of them hearing, seeing, and, and, and having their... Um, being humble, they increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. For the terrible one is brought to naught, and the scorner is consumed, talking about the false prophets, and all that watch for iniquity are cut off. They make a man an offender for a word, and that's exactly what the disciple or that's exactly what the, the, the scribes and Pharisees try to do with Jesus all the time. Make him offend, an offender for a word. Try to trip him up in his words. Try to catch him saying just one thing that would offend the law. And therefore they could make him an offender. Condemn him for that. They lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gates. And turn aside the just for a thing that is not. Therefore thus saith the Lord who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob. Jacob shall not now be ashamed. Neither shall his face now wax pale. But when he seeth his children, the work of mine hands in the midst of him, they shall sacrifice 
my, or they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and shall fear the God of Israel. They also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. The fear has transferred. God here is prophesying to these blind leaders of the blind that have become drunk, that have become, um, they're in a deep sleep. They've closed their eyes. The book's shut to them. They can't teach anybody anything of any worth. God here is now saying, though you have feared me based on their precepts, yet in the last days, God is saying he will reach out to those that are weak, those that are deaf, those that are blind, those that are meek. He will reach out to them and as children, they will see the work of his hands and they will sanctify him, the Holy One of Israel. They will fear him, the God of Israel. And those that erred in spirit, in other words, in times past, were were blind to the commands and statutes of God. Those that were Gentiles by nature shall come to an understanding spirit and they will learn doctrine. God here again is saying, hey, you Jews, you blind guides, you scribes, you Pharisees, you're missing it. You're missing out on me. But one day the deaf will hear, the blind will see the words of this book. How? Because they're going to remove from them the precepts of men. In other words, God is going to make the precepts of men to be shameful, to be hid, to be perished in the eyes of those That will eventually seek him. Going back to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. It's the words of the book. That are going to sanctify men. Not the precepts of men. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 10. The Bible says. And he called the multitude. And said unto them. Hear and understand. It's amazing because that's exactly what we found back in Isaiah chapter 29. There was the religious people. They were leading blind people that couldn't understand. And then eventually God pulled them out of it, made their words to be not in the eyes of these that were humble, these that were actually physically blind, actually suffered from hunger, actually desired the sincere milk of the word. He made the words of the religious to be not and he lifted up his own word before them. And he says here, and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth the man. So here, he asks for these to follow him undefiled by avoiding what defiles. Now I used to think that this phrase in verse 11, that which cometh out of the mouth defileth a man, was actually talking about me. In other words, what I say is going to defile me in my eyes. But I think in the context of the scriptures here, what's being referred to as the defiling agent is actually what comes out of the mouth of the false prophets here. They are to avoid what defiles, and in doing so they're actually to avoid what these drunken prophets that stumble at the word are saying. Avoid what these that are blind because the book has been sealed up to them are saying. Avoid the tradition of men because that's going to cause you to err from the command of God. Is what he's saying here in the context. These blind Pharisees and scribes are negating the commands, lifting up their traditions, and Christ here says, avoid that which cometh out of their mouth. That will defile men. He says, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth the men. The words of their mouth are what creates in you abomination, does wrong things in you and defiles you. And another example, not just the context before, but this offense actually indicates that the Pharisees knew exactly what he was talking about. Verse 12, it says, Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? So when Jesus said to the multitudes, what cometh out of the mouth, that will defile the man, the Pharisees were offended because they knew he was talking about their mouths. Continuing on in verse 13, And he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. So whatever is planted in you then, we need to be sure that it was put there by God. When a word enters in, Make sure that that word is of the book 
of life. It is the truth of the scriptures and not a tradition, not a precept of man. This is what God here is trying to distinguish between. He says, every plant my heavenly father hath not planted shall be rooted up. So if you've got something in you that is not of God, it shall be rooted up one day. Verse 14 says, let them alone. Let them alone. And I saw actually um, in my walk this past year, 2020, to be this year of separating in, in fellowships in a lot of ways. And I believe for me looking forward, 2021, I want it to be a year of separating in influences. I, I, I'm not friends with certain people that I was trying to be friends with in 2020. There's been a separation take place. And even some churches that I'm still friends with and, and pastors that I'm still friends with, we've separated a little bit in our influence on one another. And everybody's being more independent as a result of what happened in 2020. Amen, that's a good thing. But 2021, I'm going to look forward to being a year of separating myself from influences of others. Why? Because that which cometh out of the mouth, that defileth a man. And if there's anything coming from a mouth to me that is not of the Father, it's going to be lost. It's going to be plucked up and removed anyways. I might as well just not let it get there and have an effect on me. Here he says, let them alone, meaning mark and avoid. And we always forget that second part. We mark people that we don't agree with, but we don't avoid them. I do this sometimes just listening to, to, to false prophets, just because I'm interested in what they're trying to tell people, and I'll listen too much in them. I should mark them and then avoid them lest they overcome me. The Bible says of whom a man is overcome of the same he is brought into bondage. Let them alone. Mark them and avoid them lest they cause you to err. And in the new year, we ought to seek to seek the Father and the book that he sent us. They are blind. They cannot hear the book. Why? Because God has shut it. So mark and avoid these influences. If you see someone out there showing hypocrisy, mark and avoid them. If you see someone out there teaching who seemed to understand at one point, but now they're showing blatant contradictions in what they used to teach, mark and avoid. With the caveat that scriptural repentance can happen. Somebody can certainly learn from the scriptures and change their mind and do a 180 on things. Glory to God if he did that work. But sometimes we see people that understand and now they're showing blatant contradictions that are confusing and they can be what the Bible says is given to change. If we see somebody who's a teacher that is causing stumbling instead of stability in your life, mark them and avoid them. And I'm talking about all avenues here. I'm talking about vloggers. I'm talking about news reporters. I'm talking about preachers and pastors. I'm talking about family members. If there's somebody that has your ear and they're putting things in you that are not of the Father, you need to get away from it. Let them alone is what Christ here is telling the multitudes with respect to the Pharisees and scribes that have a mouth that defiles as a result of what comes out of it. <clears throat> the reality is, is that we don't need them in our life. Time is short. I don't have enough time to read my Bible, let alone give other people with bad influence on me opportunity to, to, to take my time. We have the word, even as the disciples had the word, we can walk through this same field, being our Bibles, that the disciples did as they went and they plucked food back there in the Old Testament. You know what the the scribes and Pharisees said when they went out and walked through the field and got their own food for themselves? They said, oh, they're they're not eating with clean hands. They're not eating according to the ritual of the Sabbath. They're not eating according to our way, our precepts, our traditions. And this is what the false teachers of the world are trying to do with believers today. Take you away from the commands of God and bring you into the trap of the tradition of men. We need to be weary of this. We need to be weary of this, weary of this. The Pharisees and the scribes had many traditions surrounding eating, didn't they? They they talked about cleaning cups, washing the inside and the outside. They talked about washing hands. They talked about how only on certain days can you eat certain ways, eat certain things. So many rules about eating, and yet we find in the Bible, rolls made up for the prophets, and God says, here, eat it. Eat this roll, eat this word. 
Religious leaders, media, moguls, vloggers, they all want to have control over how, where, when, and from who you receive your food. We ought to just go straight to the living word as Bible believers today. Our mandate indeed is that. Go to the book. Let him be the guide. Let him lead you into all truth. Never, never, never let men's precepts, men's traditions be the final authority in your life. We need to be watching this. You know what? It's not just others. We can set up our own traditions as some sort of higher authority in our lives. Why? Because we've got the same corrupt hearts as everybody else. But what we should do is constantly go to Jesus and receive that which is not defiled. In other words, receive from him the meat that is without leaven, that is without hindrance, that is without reservation. Go to Jesus and ask of him yourself. Verse 15 in Matthew chapter 15. He just said, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both of them shall fall into the ditch. It's clear that a news reporter is book closed. <laughs> it's clear that some of these vloggers and bloggers and whatever they talk about is books closed, right? Whether they're talking about finances or the economy or health care or whatever. You think of the, the, the Alex Joneses out there. They're book closed, right? Sealed up. Blind leaders of the blind. It's a little harder to see, but it's out there. Religious leaders, even in good Christian groups like Baptist, Independent, Fundamental, King James Only, Bible Believing, such as such, a lot of them potentially can be books closed. Maybe not universally, maybe not in all aspects, but there are certain things that they are books closed to. So we need to be watching under prayer in the Word of God. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into a ditch. So go to God, ask him yourself. Verse 15, it says, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto 